Ladies and gentlemen, welcome you all to India Edge Online. It's time for the show, right? It's show time. And uh, today we have fantastic panel joined with us today to talk more about women at work. And we're going to talk in detail about um, career progression, challenges for women, and then gender diversity. So a big shout out to all the women out there who are doing a great job out there in the corporate world and in your personal life too. So stay tuned. And believe me, I'm not uh, giving, uh, it's not like I'm not giving a shout out to men out there. You are a great support for us too. So with that note, let us kick off the show and uh, let's take this show and meet our guest at this point. We have Robin Schooling joined with us right now. Robin is the founder of Silver Zebras. Robin, you have been on the show, but if anyone out there watching the show for the first time, we would appreciate if we can talk a little bit more about you. Well, sure. I am. Um, I'm. I'm. I'm one state away from you, Nisha. Of course, we know that. So yeah. I'm Indiana, and um, I've worked for 25 plus years in human resources, and a couple of years ago, left to open my own business. Um, where I do a variety of things, but my focus is primarily on making organizations better by making HR better. And so I work with, with companies, I work with uh, primarily small, mid-sized businesses in, in that realm, uh, work with HR professionals and HR teams uh, to help them define their HR philosophies, to help them work on strategies, align what they're doing with, with the business. Uh, I speak, I write, I dabble in all sorts of fun things, and uh, it's lovely weather here today, and what else? I have four dogs, so that's a little bit about me. Oh, that's great. During the pre-show, they joined. I mean, your your yes, they uh, did. Kids, they joined with us, and uh, yeah, so thank you so much for being here with us, Robin, and I look forward to the talk. And let's talk to Aburna Sharma. She is a thought leader in the HR industry and the author of Reality Vice. But Aburna, welcome to India HR Live. And if you can talk a little bit more about you, please. Thanks, thanks, Nisha. Uh, really excited about being on this show. Uh, have heard a lot about this and have actually participated as well. So uh, a big hello to all the men and women uh, watching the show live. Uh, Aparna, uh, very, very passionate about writing, about helping youngsters in the HR profession, uh, you know, know a lot more about how they can value add uh, and create successful business partnerships as we go along. Uh, the, the most current passion is uh, my book, my maiden book, Reality Bites, the role of HR in today's world. Uh, it's been doing rounds uh, right now. It's just about a month we launched the book. Uh, thanks to all the support from young professionals and uh, senior professionals. Uh, the book is doing very well with 1,500 copies sold already uh, across the country. So look forward to chatting with you on the show. Well, wonderful to hear all the great things that are happening at your end ever now. So uh, let's meet the next person. We have uh, Ruchi Bhatia. She is the recruitment and branding lead at IBM. Hey, Ruchi, welcome to the show. Would you please talk a little bit more about you? Ruchi, you're on mute. You might want to unmute yourself. Hi, Nisha. Hello, everyone. Hi. Thank you. Hi, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here at India HR Live. Uh, I manage recruitment branding for IBM India and I work with my global teams uh, uh, for branding IBM to attract uh, key talent from the marketplace. Uh, I also design and strategize the social media strategy from the talent acquisition perspective. and. Uh, I'm a great fan of India HR Live, uh, so that's it about me. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm glad to have you in the team and look forward to hearing more about uh, how you make a difference in uh, helping women out there. So last but not the least, the wonderful person that I've met on Twitter and uh, great to connect with, Kena Sri. 
Hey, Kira, love to have you here over here at EDHLI. Thank you, Nisha. And uh, honestly speaking, my name is pronounced as Kira, but you are the only person, Nisha, to call me Kira, and I so love it. So uh, it is Kira, right? Yeah, right. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I always mess up with people's name, and uh, thank you for correcting me. So, um, why don't you? <laughs> so, why don't you talk a little bit more about you? Something more personal, so that pe people can relate to you. Um. Well, it would sound a cliche, but I have to begin by thanking you. For having me on this platform and sharing this platform with women I truly admire and who I consider stalwarts in HR. So thank you there. Um, I work with NDPC and I've been with uh, NDPC for a decade now. This is, uh, as you know, this is a public sector undertaking which, is, uh, which runs under power ministry. So basically I'm a central government employee. Probably the kind of domain to which I belong, the people I work with, uh, the essential area that I'm deployed in is quite different from corporate private world. So probably I have a different perspective on every subject. And, uh, and uh, thank you for bringing this topic which is very dear to my heart, diversity management at uh, workplace. I also happen to be convener for uh, prevention for sex of sexual harassment uh, at workplace. I'm a committee member and convener. So it's a double good answer for me. Well, great to hear that. So, um, women, you know, let's talk about um, our stuff, right? <laughs> so, women at work. So, despite the commitment from the top, as you know, and even after having this gender diversity initiative at many organizations, women are still, you know, underrepresented. I can see anything. I think currently the rate is around 4.6 percentage of CEOs. Only 4.6 percentage of CEOs are out there. Women's unions. So we are really facing an issue when it comes to um, having a more a liberal, you know, uh, programs which is out there in the organization and having a, had a support for the women in order to climb that ladder and be at the top. So let's talk more about some of the challenges for for the women out there in order to reach out to that top level in an organization. What do you think are some of the challenges? Out there for the women. Women, uh, um, Robin, can you start out from your end? We'll get the views from everyone. Well, you know, I, I think there's some validity to the age, the age-old thought that we've had that that women still um, take on the majority of of caring for the family, if you will. And, and there are some studies coming out now that, that say that that's not necessarily uh, what's derailing women in their careers, but I, but I think it continues to be an issue um, in, that, in that a lot of women still take the primary responsibility for uh, taking care of the children, taking care of aging parents, that sort of thing. And so we run into um, challenges when women step off the the career ladder, if you will, or take time out with their families. And and I think one of the aspects here in the U.S. that that really drives that is the fact that we are uh, one of four um, industrialized nations that do not have paid family leave. Um, so we look at European countries, um, the U.K., you know, one extreme that has... Um, several hundred, you know, a couple hundred days of, of paid family leave. Um, India, I believe, has 84 days of, of paid parental leave available. Um, the U.S. has none. And so we run into, and it, and it happens with men too, but, uh, but again, I think it's primarily women that take that time off um, and, and remove themselves from, from their career progression. Um, even though there's more of a, a career lattice now as opposed to just a ladder, that time away for for some can be um, an obstacle to, to getting getting them back on track, whether that be a mental obstacle or whether that be a true professional um, challenge from from removing themselves from the workplace. So I I think that's a big part of it. Absolutely, yeah. Most of the women drop their career for. Um, 
family reason, of course, mainly, but there is something more to it, right? So when it comes to getting a support from the corporation or getting the right skill set that she wanted to get or she wanted to improve on and get trained within the organizations too. Right. So, um, Ruji, can you talk from an organization perspective, what are some of the challenges um, for women out there for her career progression? So Nisha, in terms of, uh, let's talk about some statistics over here. India, uh, uh, when it talk, comes to the women workforce, participation rate uh, amongst BRICS countries has only 29% uh, participation over the age of 15 who are working in the organizations. And probably this uh, uh, rate corresponds to what we have in the companies, which is just 4% lower, so which hovers around 25%. In, and which is very very dismal rate and uh, quite unfortunate which means that there are so many uh, uh, challenges which needed to be met out and uh, which need to be uh, met uh, as far as uh, women uh, at the workplace goes. So there are a couple of challenges when it comes to women in the organization. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, earlier it was about women uh, not finding the sponsors, uh, uh, not finding the mentors and now it's all about women not finding the sponsorships. So women, at least we have gone and progressed uh, one step further where women are able to find the mentorship but when it comes to sponsorship, which means to advance women in the organizations, they are, it's really difficult to find executive sponsors for women which means that organizations will have to uh, create special programs, special uh, policies to make sure that women uh, are advancing uh, after they reach the middle management, they are advancing to the higher and the senior management roles as well. We need sponsorship for women in the organization. So that's number one, finding sponsorship for women is number one challenge. Challenge number two is that the bias against women still exists. There are a lot many number of studies which show that there is gender uh, 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 inequality when it comes to the compensation as well. So though women are working as hard as men, they are not getting rewarded uh, uh, duly well when it comes to the compensation as well. And uh, point number three in terms of the challenge is that uh, women uh, uh, have to balance, there are uh, competing priorities which women have to uh, balance, which means that uh, still the parenting duties and the parenting responsibilities are primarily a women's uh, domain and hence there are many number of women which drop out of the workforce. So if, if, if women become a mother, uh, uh, generally it is seen that when women has a second child, she usually uh, drops out of the workforce. So uh, that's, that's again a challenge that have our workplaces not become flexible enough to let women have their per, uh, personal lives, uh, be a parent at the same time, uh, uh, choose their careers also. So why is it that women are uh, choosing to drop out of workplace at the peak of their careers? Why is it, is it just because that women are choosing to uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, choose uh, family lives over a uh, career or is it that the workplaces are not flexible enough? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave at that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, I've read a study uh, about that. I think it's from PewSocialTrends.org and they said a woman who wants to reach a top position in business is better off having children early on in her career, having children later in her career or not having children at all. So it's like we have to manage our family responsibilities or wishes in uh, our aspirations about our family and we have to keep it aside. Is that so? I don't think so. Anyway, can, uh, can you talk from a, from a, you know, uh, you worked in a government organization and in a private organization. So can you talk from that perspective when it comes to what are some of the challenges that you have seen in a government sector, very particularly um, for the progression of women? All right, Nisha, I get your point. Um, well, honestly, I think that um, the model itself, the corporate ladder that one is supposed to climb itself, is historically been designed by men. So, you know, uh -huh. all leaders. In That's interesting. Actually, it is a bit, so the construct itself is a slightly flawed you can say mm -hmm. in terms of 
they would set the rules of the game they would know what is required from a top leader what should the qualifications be what should the mode of climbing up the ladder be so essentially the rules have already been set by men all women are left to do is to follow or break the rules this is point number 1 which i really find a deterrent i think it's um, uh, as much deterrent in private sector also as in government sector number 2 is uh, the top leaders are uh, they, they follow a typical anywhere anytime model which is if you have to be a top leader you should be available at any time of the day any odd hour and at any place in the world so it may not be as convenient uh, for a woman to join it right they have to appreciate that to reach a certain destination or one fixed path either a b or c everything has to be equally appreciated let the woman have her choice and the third big prevailing myth uh, in um, a government sector is that uh, the essential requirements of a top leader is very similar to the male characteristics for instance be assertive be fierce for you know assert your rights more even at the cost of your family it is always work for, uh, first uh, if there is uh, quite a lot of controversies around do not hesitate to bump in now when the woman is already accomplished uh, uh, in its uh, in her say domestic obligations she would probably not want to jump into controversies and at the peak of her career like ruchi said she uh, wants to you know probably withdraw or back and and last especially in a public sector undertaking in india which i have seen especially in my organization there is lack of female role models so as against um, so many directors and cmds that public sector undertakings have there are hardly any to find uh, if you talk about women majorly these are the four points that's interesting to hear so um I have actually muted Aberna uh, because we had a little bit of a noise or voice technical audio technical glitches and then ha huh, that's interesting I'm not able to unmute her Aberna can you try from yourself if you're able to unmute No not at all I okay no, this is not happening please No I'm not able to unmute Aberna so can you log off and log in again and then Um, yeah, sure, please. So um, that is interesting because Kena and Druji have almost said, saying that uh, we are lacking role models in the corporate sector, or not just in the corporate sector in general, but as a woman, very particularly for for us to, you know, um, go out and. Um, talk to her when it comes to getting some response or getting some feedback about how she managed um facing all these challenges at the workforce we have some of them but then in order to in order to have them come in front of us and then open up they do have some of the challenges and i'm sure aparna can talk a little bit more about that aparna can you hear us yes i can absolutely so i So I, I think I quite agree with uh, what uh, you know the three speakers have said, and they've given a very different perspective uh, to the challenges. Uh, you know, Robin talked about the fact that we actually take it upon ourselves as uh, you know a primary duty of caregiver and parenting and so on. Ruchi talked about uh, you know non-availability of sponsorships for women in in the organization, which is a big, huge challenge that women face. and kena talked about uh, the fact that the, you know the rules are defined uh, or predefined already and then one is to follow so i couldn't agree more with with all three of them however you know i'd like to submit to to the audience and to this group here that uh, in my own experience it is not a level playing field at all all right so irrespective of who sets the rules i think there is a need to redefine the career ladder and to redefine the career path uh, that we are talking about because um, if the rules were predefined at a given point in time where supposedly women seem to have aspirational deficit as as we have been condemned in the past that women had aspirational deficit i think we've come a long way irrespective of whether in uh, in the united states or it's in this part of the country uh you know i think we've we've come long way from where we were and hence 
uh, there is a need to uh, you know redefine the rules of engagement the rules of the game and also redefine the corporate ladder in terms of because it almost seems like a rat race where everybody is trying to get to the top we talk about career ladders i don't think we we actually respect career lattice which is also something which both men and women can look at uh, you know in their career journey in an organization so it's not always about vertical movement but in horizontal move, movement which gives you breadth and depth of experience so right. so in my in my view i think what is important is that it's not a level playing field the second part is that i have experienced that we talk about the glass ceiling in fact the ceiling just became a cliff all right um so if we were trying to you know break the glass ceiling somewhere along the line and i'm i'm talking about this from an experience because the rules just became harder um and it became a cliff so you know but to climb on the cliff you need to have different set of skills skills and a different kind of a mindset because it's it's really steep which means that uh, ability to network uh being politically savvy uh okay and some of these things actually have to be probably learned from men all right so they can be great tutors in you know in a workplace um you know to observe and, and look at some of these things uh the 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 third thing is you know you can say that but we have a lot of role models i think barring a few who are lucky a majority uh, of women uh you know it the social conditioning in in our system is such that um you know we have to prioritize depending on our life cycle and which stage of our life cycle are we in uh, we have to prioritize and it's always it's expected of women to actually prioritize so you know um being ambitious is seen as being aggressive uh and so on and so forth so there are societal norms that exist hence i think there is a need to redefine uh and it's more i would say you can call it as as an outside in approach or in, inside out approach in my view uh there are some societal norms that need to change along with organizations which are trying to put policies and practices in place uh taking a cue from a part and i can i button and say something yeah go ahead actually uh, yeah uh, actually what aparna said i completely agree with it uh the male characteristics of the top leader that that like we said are part of uh, rules already framed uh yeah very different from internal traits of a female personality so you know the kind of conflict arises as to who you actually are and who do you want to aspire or who do you want to aspire and be like if you happen to manage that conflict and probably you outsmart everyone and you shine like a star and you become a top leader so just in case you cannot manage that conflict and you succumb to your internal you know mellowed instincts of a female then probably that is the point where one drops out i think that is primarily the reason that women at a certain point in their career choose to withdraw so um you know one of the point that abarna said is like women have women has to redefine so in that case you know in order to redefining yeah we definitely have to work on ourselves that is for most point out there everybody but then when it comes to a corporate atmosphere do you think women um lacks authority when it comes to redefining what she wants to do within the organization robin what do you think Yeah, you know, it it I don't know the answer to this necessarily. I I would just like to pose the question um because we talk about, you know, the characteristics of a leader and and women um finding the need to uh you know, move perhaps a little more in alignment with some of those characteristics. My question becomes um aren't those characteristics changing? I mm-hmm. I think they are. I think that as more women have over the years m- moved into leadership roles, our entrepreneurs are owning um businesses, are driving that change. I think we see more um 
inclusive leadership skills? Um, has empathy um, become something that we that we're more tuned into with our leaders? Uh, emotional intelligence, you know, any kind of buzzword we want to give it, um, but that that historic view of the command and control male leader um, is 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 shifting, has shifted. Is that are there more traditional female characteristics that we are now accepting as necessary for successful leadership? That that's sort of my question on, on that. Absolutely. So from an organization perspective, what should a management do or the whole organization should do in order to help them build those skills if they are lacking it? Um, so what do you recommend or some of the steps that organization should do? I mean, I, I, I think it becomes, um, you know, this is not an overnight flip a switch and this happens, but I think we can sort of see the evolution of that um, that change in leadership um, competencies, leadership, you know, what we demand of our leaders, what we look to our leaders to do. Um, there, there's a more inclusive structure in, in a lot of organizations, and I think that's a positive impact that women in power, women in leadership roles have brought into the way we work, the way we operate. Um, you know, I'm 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 looking at it glass half full as opposed to glass half half empty, and think that that's going to continue. Um, I think there are really good things as as much as we may struggle with with getting women into positions of power or providing opportunities or, or kind of making these these inclusionary efforts work. Um, there's some really positive changes that I think have have come about because of what women have already done. And so, uh, if I were to just add to you know what Robin is saying, and my answer to that would actually be organizations trying to create a gender-neutral workplace. Okay, mm -hmm. never mind differences. All right, uh, and you know, learning to respect the differences. Uh, I think, and and then having, um, you know, celebrating differences in a manner where, um, you know, they. Uh, they are treated as, as the way they are and not making a big deal about being a male or a female. I think um, it's easier said than done. Uh, we see that a lot of organizations talk about being gender neutral. But, um, you know, some of the characteristics that you talked about, you know, if that is developed in the senior leadership and they sort of start walking with um, you know, it's going to really help in, you know, taking some steps towards creating a gender neutral workplace. So that um, takes me to my next question, which is all about gender diversity. You know, uh, as you said, let's not make a deal about uh, differentiating men and women. But then studies shows that, you know, companies run by women perform better. So do you have any takes on that? Nisha, I would like to. Okay. So, Nisha, uh, I'm pleased to share on this panel with everyone that recently uh, IBM was awarded as one of the best uh, 13 employers for uh, women in tech. And that goes on to show the culture of IBM. Uh, so, when it comes to diversity, diversity is a business imperative at IBM. And that is what is reflected in IBM culture. And it is not just a priority or a choice, but it is really a business imperative, which means it deserves, it gets the attention that it deserves. The agenda is really, really important for our leaders, uh, not just HR, but for our business leaders as well, because they really understand the fact that uh, having diverse uh, team uh, really contributes to the bottom line, and that's that's it, right? So that's a very, very strong business case to make sure that investments are done fall on women and to uh, create such policies and programs which support and advance the cause of women. So to give you an example, to share uh, with an example, uh, uh, we have different kind of leadership development programs for women at different stages of their career. For the 
uh, entry level women we have a program called elevate which again uh, is related to leadership development for the middle management we have a leadership development program called business leaders uh, relationships and influence bri and for very senior leaders women leaders we have a program called crucibles so different uh, women uh, uh, depending upon what stage of career they are they are invited to participate in these leadership development programs so that adequate uh, skills are being built uh, going back to the point which robin uh, was making that leadership skills are really really important for women to have authority at the workplace right and that is what ibm focuses on well thank you plus, for, plus for you have a that. female ceo as well yes <laughs> of course <laughs> right well thank you well, for bringing that up priji and robin yeah go ahead robin oh well one of the things um i, I was reading a, a study recently by um by gallup um where they they did some research and they looked specifically at at two industries they were looking at retail um mm -hmm. i wrote it down so i wouldn't forget it they were looking at retail and hospitality um mm -hmm. and they studied um more than 800 business units from two different companies in in these industries and they found that um within these businesses and within these business units the organizations that had um very gender diverse business units um the retail company with very gender diverse business units had a 14% higher average revenue than the business units that had less gender diversity and in hospitality um those business units that were more gender diverse had a 19% higher average quarterly net profit so there's certainly information out there there's research that shows um understanding um how gender diversity can drive business results i mean that's there so it's not just it's not just nice to do nice to have let's be inclusive let's focus on these things but but there's you know a definite correlation between doing that as a as a business practice and driving results absolutely and uh, that reminds me to talk about you know i read a study um, and this was done by quantopium and they they actually promoted the idea of uh, you know women running business in um women uh, companies run by women perform better and in that case they have mentioned that uh, these companies are good at uh, making revenue managing risk and becoming more innovative and one of the interesting note which i highly recommend and highly point out at this point is women are disproportionately hired to run companies that find themselves in deep trouble and for example they have highlighted yahoo um and quoted Marisa Mayer and uh GM and quoted Mary Barr. So yeah, those studies are out there but then still why these organizations don't some of the organizations don't get um to to kind of promote their women leaders. So um Kena in uh in the uh, Aparna from your perspective do you think that um women led initiatives get more mileage then men led initiatives um this is in my opinion it also depends on the kind of enterprise that you are working with for instance if it is about entrepreneurship then it actually does not matter what uh, uh, you know what lab like corporate ladder uh, kind of differentiates for men or women it ultimately um, what ultimately matters is the effort that you put put in the competency that you have and the time that you give to the project but uh, if you talk about a governance setup then like i said the rules of the game are already defined so you don't have you cannot bring about much change uh, so in my opinion it largely depends on the uh, network that you have and the enterprise sector that you work in so uh, what's your take on it over now on on a lighter side um you know i would say that women end up working twice as hard uh you know which means that ultimately the enterprise is much much more successful because you put in that much more you know much more sincere and and so on i mean we have examples we see uh you know uh that um, 
women actually end up working harder. All right, so that was just on a lighter note. So, uh, you know, the point uh, that I have and which I keep reflecting upon is that uh, a lot of organizations have quoted, or we say that men uh, led or women led organizations. And the recent case in point is the Companies Act 2013, which actually has mandated organizations to have uh, independent women directors on the board. All right. And in some other countries, I mean, India, and it has been mandated. And the date was 31st October 2014, and finally it was extended to 31st March 2014. So, a lot of organizations you must have read in the recent past have done a tick in the box exercise by actually bringing on board these women. Okay, in certain other parts of the world, uh, it's again mandated 40% women, you know, have to be there. Uh, I think it's in Germany. Uh, also in Finland and certain other countries. The point is, uh, you have them you know, in the ecosystem, you have them, but I think there is no sensitization uh, that happens in organizations, irrespective of you know whether they are led by or women, towards the other people. When you have either 50% and, and in, unfortunately we don't have a 50% representation in an organization of women in India, uh, in in any particular organization, it's not a 50-50. Whatever number of uh, you know percentage that you have, and if you're talking about, for example, in this case, level people, you know, do people or do, do men actually know how to engage with women who have been recently brought on board? All right, how does this change the dynamics of the team and the group? Uh, you know, that was functioning without the fair sex all this while. All right. I think these, the fact that uh, you have um, mandates like this actually get you into the door, get you actually onto the table. But it goes back to the fact that you have to earn your seat on the table. You have to prove yourself every time that you are actually given a responsibility. And uh, you know, do your bit in terms of actually creating it, uh, creating a much more level playing field because uh, you know, the, it, it isn't at this point in time as far as our experience is. So mandating something, in my view, uh, you know, is good, but it almost seems like being enforced, and it's probably detested, uh, you know, by the other gender since it is almost imposed. Well, this actually takes me to the question, does women have it all, right? Um, and I totally agree with you. We have to take our own ownership when it comes to uh, achieve what we wanted to achieve. That is out there. So, uh, guys, we are almost halfway through to the topic. And then I wanted to give a big shout out to my audience, uh, to our audience. And, uh, they are a big part of the discussion. And if you, if you wanted to ask any questions to our panel, shoot your question with a hashtag. As you know it. So um, there is an interesting question that has come up on our Twitter stream, and that is from Rekshita. She's saying, "Don't hire a mom to be, but what about dad to be? Women were born to be mothers, and men, of course, work harder. So uh, do you think you know there? It, it, it's natural, and it is out there that if you are a pregnant woman, or um, you know, if you are." expecting at this point and if you are out there in the job market you are not easily going to get a job and if you are at work you will be considered uh, less effective so that is out there but when it comes to a dad to be things are different so how can we change this how can we change this attitude I mean I, I think the one of the one of the primary ways we change that attitude again and I and I'm I'm positive so I sort of see these things evolving in a good way but the way we change that attitude is to make sure that men are involved in this conversation too you know they have to be part of of these discussions when we talk about these issues that that's the first step um, I have a friend who is um, having a baby here in the next month or so, and her husband will be taking um, off for the first three to four months, and he will be staying home with the baby while she continues to work. Um, you know, and that's 
that's a that's a change. That's an evolution, and I think there are more and more families like that. Um, so that's positive, but that's a man that's involved in the conversation. Absolutely, and there has a little bit of a cultural culture to it because I can see over here in the United States, majority of the men who are trying to become um, who are trying to support the family and woman in the home uh, is the sole, um, you know, uh, breadwinner. So, but when it comparing when that, when I'm comparing that to Indian culture, I don't see that as happening much more because in traditional, you know, men have uh, become a breadwinner in India and uh, women have to be uh, a supporter role. So. That is, if that is going to change in India, I'm, I'm so much happy to see that. So again, thank you, Robin, for adding your support. Nisha, whatever, yeah, okay. we, whatever we say, but the fact of the matter is that Indian women do suffer with a daughterly guilt, and uh -huh. that is the family and social pressure to take care of adults, uh, senior citizens, and elderly, and even in-laws and children, lies primarily on women. So yeah, right. it's going to take some time for the scenario to change. Till then, women in India, working women in India precisely, will have to suffer the uh, double burden syndrome that we say in psychology, wherein she has to take the burden of two responsibilities simultaneously. One, that of work, and the second, uh, that of her domestic obligation. Absolutely. And it, there is a lot about upbringing too, because in my family, I'm the eldest person, and eldest kid, if you can see, and I'm, I'm managing my home. I mean, helping my dad and mom and uh, helping them to, you know, uh, bring my siblings, uh, I mean, bring up my siblings. So it is all about upbringing too. So there is an interesting question that has come up on our Twitter stream, and uh, um, Auburn, I want you to take this question and it's from Saran Rami and he was saying very less organizations understand diversity and benefits. Also having more female talent is not about diversity. So we always talk about these jargons every time right this diversity or gender diversity. So do you think that having female or more female is not about diversity? What was the first part of the question? Uh, can, can you just repeat that, Nisha? Uh, the question is having more female talent. It's actually a quote. Having more female talent is not diversity. So that's that's his take. So what is your take on it? Do you have a I different perspective? Agree. I absolutely agree with that. Because, uh, you know, let's leave aside the word female. You know, again, we are char characterizing uh, the talent into male or female. Any organization needs talent, irrespective of whether it's men or women. All along, it has it has all been men. Okay, with all these initiatives that organizations are now having, uh, th there is an impulse to bring in more women uh, because they're educated, they're employable. Uh, okay, and uh, uh, you know they have all all that it takes to actually become a very active part of the workforce. So the fact that they are coming in actually adds to the culture in the organization. Uh, you know, it's much more healthy. Uh, also, uh, I I think you know the ecosystem just like you know, overall. Uh, you know, becomes much more positive and nurturing you know, when when you have women in the organization. So, just like in the society or in, in the universe at large, you have coexistence of men and women. Similarly, in an organizational ecosystem, bringing in female talent because they do constitute 50 percent of you know the total population uh, that we have. And employable, talented, competent women are an asset, just like competent, talented men are an asset to any organization. Absolutely. And let's move on to the next question that is on our Twitter stream. And uh, it says, questions on um, spiritual and family status directed to female candidates. So this is all about, you know, the hiring or the front end process of uh, hiring a person in an organization, hiring a, an employee in an organization. So how appropriate it is to um, to actually avoid 
this bias and what do you recommend in order to avoid this sort of a bias when it comes to you know um, hiring a person who is more responsible towards the family who has to take care of his uh, um, kids and uh, elderly members in the organization so normally I know asking this question is pretty much illegal over here in the United States and uh, taking out if you understanding if you have more responsibilities at home and then you know we are not ready to hire you such kind of a things but in order to avoid this sort of a bias and take the more uh, positively by understanding their attitudes and skill set what do you recommend for all the hiring managers and recruiters out there when it comes to hire people with potential not based on the um, bias that they have um, who wants to take that question yeah. so my, I have uh, briefly I have two points to make here uh, like you see men have a very uh, clubbing attitude you know they will support each other like self-help groups whenever even even if one man gets into crisis why don't we women do that I mean when a lady who has taken this sabbatical returns back to work, how much of a support does she get from other women around? Why do we? Why are we not so closely connected and networked as men are? So number one, I think networking for women is as important as it is for men in the industry. Number two is uh, gender sensitization is highly imperative. It has to be done. Men and women both have to learn to respect one another, and uh, gender sensitization at workplace is very important. Be it by means of sign boards or workshops or training programs or individual training, but men have to realize that at workplace, a woman is not a man's better half. It's one plus one making, and it's a period of that. Yep, that's a great point out there, Tina. Uh, so, uh, and there is a question uh, right um, there from Nupur Padak. She's saying immediate action points to be adopted by companies to bring in gender neutrality. So, we always say men and women are equal, but when it comes to uh, having a gender neutrality, what do you guys recommend an organization should do? Ruji, would you like to answer that question? So, uh, Nisha, my view is that uh, first of all, uh, organizations can uh, do a lot of uh, uh, actions, I mean, take a lot of actions when it comes to making their uh, workplaces gender neutral. Uh, they need to take, uh, do the thorough assessment. First step is to do the assessment uh, and uh, really see to it that uh, whether my workplace or the kind of culture uh, that I'm providing to the top talent or to the talent in my organization, is it really gender neutral or there are certain biases which exist in my processes, which exist in my policies and to do away with those biases. To, so the first step is to have, have a very honest look at the current situation, the current scenario, find the gaps and then create an action plan, create a strategy strategic plan of action to remove those biases to do uh, uh, fill those gaps which exist in the workplace. Uh, the other could be uh, some of the other uh, smaller organizations can learn from uh, uh, you know uh, uh, best practices and they then really adopt those practices which fit uh, their organization. So they can really there are uh, some organizations which are doing really really well they are listed as uh, best uh, workplaces for the top uh, uh, top workplaces for the working mothers. So uh, the, 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 the uh, lesson here for the other organizations is to do really take a look at and learn from what is working well in those organizations. How is it that year on year they are able to uh, uh, bag those awards uh, uh, as being the number one uh, or, or being the uh, top employer of choice when it comes to working mothers and really learn from those organizations that what is working well in those organizations and see to it find the best fit for your workplace and see to it that whether those practices will make the best fit in my organization and if the answer to that is yes then really adopt those practices so that would be my view. So Nisha, I have two points uh, here and one example to talk about how to create a, a gender neutral workplace. The first one is let's all be professional first, men and women later. 
let's reckon ourselves as men and women uh, which is secondary be professionals at workplace first that's the first point second point is let's stop expecting or pitching for uh, concessions on the basis of gender okay very clearly i think uh, the fact that there is maternity leave organizations have introduced paternity leave also so there is some amount of you know changes that organizations are bringing in the, in themselves as far as policies and practices are concerned to give you an example okay uh, we celebrate international women's day on 8th of march all right now i understand that it's an international uh, day and celebrated and why only celebrate womanhood on on 8th of march i think each one of us needs to be celebrated every single day man or woman okay we are all very unique we are so gifted so we need to be you know celebrated each and every day the fact is organizations go to one extreme trying to celebrate women's day you know leery women with all the fanfare and you know all the goodies that get doled out to them and the men get left out why can't we celebrate women's day with men in it in the organization and we're talking about creating uh uh you know an ecosystem where men and women are equal so when you're celebrating something you leave them out you know they as it is feel left out and neglected or ignored at that point in time so in my own experience in in one organizations you know that i was associated with not very long ago we celebrated women's day with men uh, you know in the office and in the organization as well both uh gender celebrated women's day so they were actually celebrating we also included families right which means that if you were to have a celebration like that things like these help create you know this feeling of nobody is left out and ignored and thus bring about equality in at least uh, in, by way of perception okay it's going to take some time before we get there in terms of you know the actual stuff but something like this is very basic Well, uh, thank you for bringing that example. Yeah, Nisha, I would like to share one more example uh, 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 to the point that Aparna made. Uh, uh, that reminds me of the example by Accenture. Accenture has. Uh, I'm really big fan of the uh, practices uh, which Accenture follows. Uh, they have a women network uh, or a diverse city network called Wahini, and they invite both men and women for their diversity networking events. And that is a very good and cool example. I mean, why to let women, uh, men out uh, when it comes to celebrating diversity? Make them feel included so that uh, it will sensitize them to the issues that are faced by women. And at the same time, you are educating them, creating more awareness, uh, ensuring that. Uh, women deserve uh, uh, women get the uh, you know uh, their due recognition at the workplace and are uh, recognized by by uh, their colleagues and uh, peers so uh, you said wahini by, right yeah wahini yes that that's a great example yeah wonderful wonderful so let's take a let's take a you know review it. and if you all can give us some examples or maybe point out some organization like Rajee has done right now when it comes to Accenture, and I'm sure IBM is doing a great work too. But if you guys can um, shout out to some of the companies that you know from India or global, um, from United States, across the world, um, who are really supporting a woman at work, who would you want to give a shout out to? I I named Monsanto and Novartis two organizations that I've worked for and I have experienced it myself. Right. And how about you, Kena? Like I said, I belong to a domain which is uh, uh, very different, and all my five fingers are are in sugar dips <laughs> because government takes proper care of women workforce. It has special provisions of leave. and uh, it takes care of uh, gender sensitization issues also special training special sabbaticals so all nice and special things are reserved for us so on that note i am probably the lucky one <laughs> wonderful to hear and how about uh, yeah one point more we have a special committee um, uh, for a prevention of sexual harassment of workplace and it's such a respite to women uh, uh, in this i must mention that Oh yeah, we have, 
Absolutely. We haven't even touched that sensitive part, sexual harassment, right? Because it always comes in when a discussion comes on women uh, at work. Robin, it's your turn now. Yeah, you know, uh, there are a couple of organizations that um, that I'm aware of that have led uh, um, led some efforts focused focused on the bottom line, really, at the end of the day, to to retain employees, to retain key talent, um, and the, those are Ernst and Young and Deloitte, um, who both over the last several years have instituted um, some very uh, well-regarded work workplace flexibility programs. They saw that as a, a key a key driver of retaining um, women who had who had joined, who were highly talented, um, who were making decisions to to step away from the organization because they decided it's time for me to have children, or I need to take some time off, or I need more flexibility because my family needs me, and so. Um, Ernst & Young, as an example, um, really focused on creating a, um, again, a career lattice, you know, we've used that word already today, but a career lattice so that people could step away from the organization and not, they were very cognizant of not making that a negative experience. So both men and women took advantage of this, um, but it allowed people to leave, not lose their status in the organization stay on the partner track, all of these sorts of things, um, but yet have that flexibility that they needed in their lives. And it was primarily a, a, a women who took advantage of it. One of the numbers I saw were um, from a couple of years ago, 1,700 women and about 300 men took advantage of this particular program, but it really was designed to retain the critical talent that they needed. Um, and, and help them through their, you know, the evolution of their personal life. And so it was a, a gender issue, but not really. It's a family issue. It was a business issue. It is. It is a family issue, as you see in your organization, as your own family. So um, we have time for a couple more questions, and I wanted to uh, take the next one from Shankari Nandi. I guess I pronounced your name correctly. Um, so uh, she's asking, how do organizations create inclusive environment for women who come after a break? Which is a great deal, right? Maternity leave or even career break. For example, me, right? I moved to United States four years ago and uh, I don't have this work visa until this, until this point. And I do have this four years of break. So what do you recommend for 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 those organizations out there in order to create an inclusive environment for women who comes after a break. Who wants to take that question? I mean, I think I think you're a perfect example of that, Nisha, because um, yes, companies um, companies need to create um, create an environment that welcomes people back. Um, the companies are also changing their perception of, of why people may have a break um, in their career. And and you're like I said, you're I think you're the perfect example of it because you have certainly taken responsibility for while you may not be officially at a company getting a paycheck, you are the busiest person I know. You you are maintaining your career even though you're not getting a paycheck for it from company A. And so it's sort of that personal, um, professional, ongoing development. And I think organizations see that now, that someone can leave the traditional workplace for whatever reason um, and still still grow professionally, still be developed, um, still focus on, on, on long-term career goals and aspirations. Uh, so again, I'm very positive today, but, but I see companies um, changing their view of what that means. And seeing seeing those breaks as a good thing and a growth opportunity, and they want to bring people back in after those breaks. Well, I'm really glad to hear that from you, Robin, and it's an honor to hear it from you, very particularly because you have been always a mentor for me out there when it comes to being social or doing uh, what I wanted to pursue out there in the HR industry, or even becoming a good person too. 
<laughs> so, uh, do you guys, do you know any other organization who really support? Um, yes, Nisha at yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Nisha at IBM, uh, we have a Bring Her Back program that really supports uh, women who have been on their, on their maternity leave and we really encourage women to join back the workforce. So that's uh, a, a key program from IBM which really goes out uh, to support the women uh, and help them assimilate back into the workforce after their maternity leave or after they have chosen to go the parenting way. Then there are other examples, for example, Google has the program called G Career, G India has the program called Restart, which is a, a returnship program that was launched in 2008 and it helps experts who might have taken a break in their career to uh, come back to work. Uh, PwC has the program called Back to Work. Again, JP Morgan has re-entry program. Accenture also has return to work program. So a couple of companies' uh, examples are there which support this uh, uh, return uh, to back or bring her back kind of a uh, uh, you know program and, and really help women assimilate back into the workforce culture. So to add, to add to all the names that uh, Ruchi mentioned, uh, two more which is uh, Deloitte, I think Robin mentioned that, but Deloitte has a very good ramp off, a uh, ramp on and ramp off kind of a program with which they have on the same lines for assimilation. And the second one which I personally experienced is Deutsche Bank. Uh, Deutsche Bank has a very, very, very good, very sound program, uh, and all something which is very unique. They have a they have a helpline uh, besides the program helpline, you know, which women actually call anonymously. Uh, offers, uh, you know, uh, uh, counseling and some kind of, you know, uh, postpartum blues that women may have, uh, you know, counseling around around those and, you know, taking care of uh, some of those tricky, uh, not knowing who else to ask kind of kind of questions. So I know from uh, statistics overall, uh, because you know we set it up at the time when I was there. Uh, that it was very, very popular and was very actively used. What was discussed there, obviously, you know, confidentiality reasons one really doesn't know. But I know that, uh, you know, that was a big hit. Well, thanks everyone for being on the show today and sharing such a wonderful panel discussion, such a great insights, and being there as an inspiration to all of the women out there. Um, so thank you so much again. We are about to wrap up. I know I need to cut you all off, but I really wanted to continue this conversation because it is much more interesting than um, than any other topic personally to me because it relates to me. So uh, as you all know. So um, guys, we wanted to wrap up the show at this point and uh, give a big shout out to all the women out there to pursue what you want to pursue. Just go ahead and achieve it. Go ahead and pursue it. Just don't look back. <laughs> All right, and to to our audience, we really, really appreciate you being there and supporting us in tweeting and commenting on all all our hashtag India Edge on Live. So making the show a pretty great success. Thanks again. And uh, so last but not least, bye to all. Talk to you all later. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.